Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ray Lagan, and I'm the Executive Director for the Graham v. Simsbury Chamber of Commerce. I have the privilege today of spending some time with Bob Rybeck, who is the President and CEO from Geislers. We're hoping to spend a little bit of time today finding out a little bit more from Bob about Bob, his history with the with the food industry, come, uh, some of the things that's happening in the food industry, and in particular with Geislers, and uh, some big events coming up in early May. So I uh, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to doing a little exploration and discovery together with Bob today. So welcome, Bob. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Excited to talk about everything today. Perfect. Well, we've got a little bit of time, and I'd love to have you just start, if you don't mind, kind of introducing yourself to people and tell us a little bit about your history and how you got started uh, in the food industry. Sure. So um, I guess I guess I got started because I was born into it. Okay. So my family started Geister Supermarkets back in 1923. So 101 years ago, um, we had a big anniversary last year, and I'm a fourth generation family. So we have um, four people currently running the business: my brother, uh, myself, and then my two cousins, uh, Ryan and Eric. And you know we really are just trying to continue the traditions that you know our our great grandfather set out which is to serve the local community and you know provide the best fresh and local products okay and it sounds like it's working because you have a pretty good reputation and uh from what i understand you guys are planning to stay around for a while so we'll get to that in a few minutes right sure okay um tell us bob how you got started you said it's fourth generation but you know everybody goes to high school and from there what, what was it like for you getting started yeah i i think i actually caught the bug when i was um probably you know eight or nine years old because my grandfather would bring me to the store in the summer and i would run around the produce department <laughs> and i don't know if that's where i got the got the bug for um you know visiting farms and things like that but uh when i got out of um out of college, I came in as a as a grocery manager, mm -hmm. and I worked my way up from there. I had I had worked in the stores all through throughout high school, and in fact, um, my senior year of high school, I actually helped renovate one of our stores in South Windsor. Wow. I was on the construction crew during the day, hands on, and I then I went home and I took a shower and I came and worked the produce department at night. So, um, so again, when I got out of college, um, I just kind of had an interest in coming back to the business and. You know, our parents were never, you know, you know, pushy or, or anything about us joining it. And and one day I asked my mom, I said, you know, I really haven't have an interest in this, but you guys haven't haven't asked us. And they said, well, we really wanted you to be able to make your own decision. But if pretty wise, that's parenting. what you want to do, yeah. you know, we'll we'll uh, have a discussion around, you know, where there's a, an opportunity. And I was able to to find myself in the grocery department and, you know, sort of learn the business from there. And took on some responsibilities buying different categories. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of instrumental um, back before, you know, um, celiac disease and, and gluten-free was, you know, widely known. We helped um, one of the local celiac groups in the Manchester community um, select products for our store. So we created a small oh, section yeah. and we grew it over time. And that kind of gave me the experience of working, you know, with a local group and also uh, with sourcing products from different, you know, different purveyors in order to fulfill that need. Okay. Well, we'll want to hear more about the local sourcing in a few minutes, but sure. any regrets? Uh, did you ever think, uh, I made a mistake, I shouldn't have gone into this industry? No, not at all. Um, I mean, I, I love it every day, and, and what I get to do now is probably the most exciting part. I get to come to talk to folks like you. I get to go out and visit, you know, local farms and local producers, and, you know, we like to say that one of our one of our you know goals is really to tell the untold story okay so there's so many great um, small producers out there that are doing fantastic things and we get to go visit them every single day you know just last week i was in hartford at the swift factory mm -hmm. um, which is you know an old gold leaf factory yeah um, they did the gold leaf for the hartford uh, capital the dome capital. in fact most of the the domes around the country that have gold on them and when the factory was finally shut down um, a lot of the land was given to Habitat for Humanity to build houses, but the, the brick factory itself was kind of run down and they were trying to decide what to do with it. And because of its historic significance, they couldn't demolish it. So um, through a couple of nonprofits, they put together a co-working space mm -hmm. and then also some shared kitchen spaces. So it's, it's a little bit of, above a food incubator. So once you've sort of graduated to where you need a kitchen space to produce your items, this is where you can go and you can rent out the space. Oh. And our produce director, Andy, 
um, has been working with a local guacamole producer called Pops <laughs> Famous Guac, okay. who's out of Bloomfield. I actually met her at a farmer's market. And you know, we helped her uh, adapt her product for you know, supermarket shelf. So when we met her, she, she was just packaging it herself in her, her kitchen, it was kind of a cottage industry. Yeah. And we helped her get safety seals and UPCs and all of the labeling right. And through that process, um, she took a space in the Swift factory. So we visited a few weeks ago and come to find out there's tons of other great items there. Yeah. Um, from local coffee roasters to people making juice, um, growing microgreens, and even someone running a, a, a restaurant sort of as a ghost kitchen where all of his deliveries are through you know, Uber Eats and DoorDash. Interesting. So that's one of the fun things that I get to do is, yeah. is go out and meet these folks and get to learn their unique story and then tell it to our customers. Well, as a Chamber of Commerce, I love the fact that you're working local, supporting local, and helping not just to buy the product and resource from them, but you're also helping them get started, launching. You're doing my job, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> The, the food service industry is kind of a catch term right now, and I'm not sure I'm even using it correctly because it, it involves the farms, it involves the retailers, it involves uh, you know the grocery stores themselves, and and maybe warehousing. How do you guys fit into that? And am I using the term correctly? As a restaurant, who who is food service industry today? Yeah, a, a lot of times you know the the term food service tends to apply more towards you know on premises dining, so okay. restaurants or you know if you're at a stadium or things like that. But the lines are really starting to blur, mm-hmm. and what we're doing is we're sort of filling that need of convenience. So people are cooking less and less, they're living busy lifestyles, they wanna go to you know, the soccer game and then the concert, or you know, their kids are doing a million activities. And, and you know, restaurants kind of fulfill that need, but there's also um, you know, people that are watching their budget and wanna do it in a con- cost conscious way. So mm-hmm. we found, found ways to produce meals that are ready to heat and eat or products that are already marinated and seasoned, and that's really where the growth of our business is. Okay. So it's starting to become a little bit more like food service. Well, again, it's a it's a, a blending, I guess, of those different areas and overlapping, you know, where you can make things work. You know, you, you mentioned something there about new products and that, but also the size, just the, the physical size of a, of a grocery store, of a retail store has changed quite a bit in the decades recently, hasn't it? I mean, what's all, all that all about? Yeah, and, and, and it continues to evolve. I think, um, you know, I, I, every time I talk to my folks about, about change and they say, well, this is not how we used to do it, oh. I remind them of a, an article about our um, great grandfather and grandfather from when they moved the store from Broadbrook mm-hmm. to Warehouse Point. And they were in what, what's now currently the main fish market, and they were building what was a crazy big store. Okay. Uh, of 10,000 square feet. Oh, my, and that was big. And okay. it was going to have refrigerated produce, which was unheard of at the time. Okay. Um, and when, so what time frame was that? I'm sorry. This what? was in the 50s. In the 50s, yep. okay. Right. So, you know, 10,000 square feet was considered obscenely big at the time. Yeah. And then you fast forward, you know, a few decades and we have, you know, super centers and 80,000 square foot stores. But, you know, slowly, um, as needs change and everything, and you're filling in space in, in smaller communities, I think the trend is starting to go back towards the smaller stores. Oh, really? Okay. Well, that was going to be kind of a follow-up question. What's next with those changes, and where, where's the industry going? What do you see happening? Yeah, I, I, I think it's going more towards smaller stores and filling that convenience need like we had talked about. Okay. So slightly smaller selection of products. You know, people are shopping across so many different channels now. Mm-hmm. Um, they may be going, you know, online. They may be going to a big box store um, to doing some of their stock up. But for their fresh products, they really want to have that, you know, that convenience in their backyard. So we'll talk about it in a little bit, but your new renovated store in Granby, what's the square footage of that one? Uh, that's about 30,000 square feet. Okay, and yep. so that is that always been that size or is that the... It, it's actually been smaller than that. Okay. And in the 90s, it was expanded um, primarily to add the, the kitchen, which allowed us to get into more of the, the food service, meals to go. Preparing things, right? Unpared. Prepared foods, right. Okay. I'm going to ask you uh, to respond to something. You wrote something in the state of Connecticut a year or so ago. This is during the time when retail sales for wine was thought about being moved to the grocery store. Let me me read what you wrote, and then I'm going to ask you to comment on it. Sure. You said, we differentiate ourselves by offering the best local and fresh products, clean stores, friendly service, and communicating this difference to our customers with a personal family touch. 
all aspects that our local package stores are doing as well if they're run well. So you made that statement, and I'm, I'm just curious, first of all, what happened with that whole area of the wine being sold to local retail stores? Is that done, or is it in the works, or what's going on? There? No, it's it's actually very much active. So, um, you know, folks that are interested in learning more can go to ctwinenow.com, and they can sign up for emails that will keep them updated. Okay. Um, last year there was a bill; it didn't make it out of committee. Um, this year, in this, in the short legislative session, uh, all bills have to come up. Um, you know, through leadership. Right. So it really isn't the time. Next year with a much longer legislative session, I'm sure there's gonna be another bill. And the issue is really around con consumer convenience. Mm -hmm. So customers are overwhelmingly telling us that they want wine in supermarkets. Right. And, and we're really in the business of, you know, delivering on what our customers want. That's why our business has evolved through the ages to have, you know, more prepared foods or restaurant style foods. Right. So we're really just trying to help deliver that message to, you know, the legislatures, and we need consumers to, you know, voice their opinion when when the time counts. Well, I'm going to be network neutral because I represent some packed stores and some restaurants and some grocery providers as well. So I'm not playing a horse in that race, other than to say it's interesting to know that it's being uh, still looked at and, and the legislature is still considering it. It sounds like, right? Yeah, I, I think you're going to see some more action on it um, next year. Okay. And you know, there is a there is that website out there, ctynow.com and you can follow their Facebook page, or you can sign up for emails, and, and if you see your local state legislature walking around, just you know, tell them what you think about it. I mean, we found out that I think over 80% of um, customers in the state uh, would like to see that convenience, mm -hmm. so we're really just out there advocating on their behalf. All right, well again, I'm gonna stay neutral. <laughs> Uh, go back to your comment, though. Um, it sounds like motherhood and apple pie in a lot of ways. You're trying to make your store as welcome and as inviting as we can. What would I experience as a consumer coming to your store? How would I feel what you just you know, kind of expressed in that statement? Yeah, I mean, I think when you walk into our, sto our stores, especially the newly renovated ones, you know, there's going to be a huge accent on fresh. Okay. And, you know, there's nobody better than your, your local grocer, especially your local family owned grocer who's been here for a hundred years to bring, you know, the, the, the neighboring farms. You do you know, have some bragging rights in that capacity. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of people like to say they do local, you know, it's kind of a buzzword, but you know, when you come in our store, you're going to see signs for farms that are literally the next town over mm -hmm. or in the same town. And that's who we go out and we work with, you know, not farms that are, Three or four hundred miles away, like you know, other stores may do. Um, we certainly have those products, but we really pride ourselves on trying to be as close to the store as possible. So, how do your your local providers feel about that? They must enjoy the fact that they are local. They're getting advertisement by being right there as well. Are they getting yeah, I, I mean, they they love being able to work direct. They love that direct connection because, you know, the farmers are just so passionate about what they do. Mm -hmm. um, I was visiting um, Vincent Farm in Suffield, Connecticut, and he. He grows vegetables and he also grows tobacco. And, you know, he said to me, he says, you know, I grow the tobacco because it helps pay the bills, but what I'm really passionate about is growing the vegetables. I see. You know, and for them to get it from their field to the store in the shortest amount of time so the customer gets the freshest produce, that means something to them too. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're, we're so passionate about it that we'll actually go there and pick it up. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not waiting for them to drive it to a warehouse and then on another truck. You know, we think it's it's that important that we'll go out and, you know, pick it basically out of the field and put it wow. in our store the next day. That's commitment. How, how are you are you saturated now with local providers? Are you still looking for local bakers or, or you know, whatever? Yeah, it might we're, be? we're always looking um, and we certainly want to have someone in um, every single category. OK, so. You know, we're pretty good with farms. You know, obviously they're they're more seasonal. Right. Um, we are, you know, talking to some folks now that um, grow local cattle ah. um, to do a local beef program. Okay. And um, we're also looking for some more, you know, baked goods or breads. You know, we do our own in-house um, fresh baked products. Of course. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's always room to to highlight other people that are doing something well out there. So if any of our listeners are, you know, entrepreneurs and have something going on in the kitchen, they should come and talk to you maybe. Absolutely. Local sourcing. Okay, that's good to know. Let's shift a little bit from a technology standpoint. Uh, a couple of questions. One is just social media. I know you've dabbled in there. You've, you've had a, your own podcast on occasion. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and what that might be? Sure, like? yeah. So I think you know, my foray into, into social media really got kicked off during um, the COVID pandemic when 
we were just trying to let people know at a moment's notice what we were stocked with. Okay. So we did a lot of ad hoc videos um, as product was rolling into the store. You know, everyone was looking to get toilet paper and and meat and other proteins, and that helped grow. You know, my comfort level with it. Okay. And since then, uh, we've evolved quite a bit. Where a lot of our um, social media is also dual purposed. So we we post it on Facebook and Instagram. And then we also take snippets of it for educational purposes and we put it inside our, our digital ad. Okay. So if you go and if you go to our website to see what's on sale, it's it's more of a, a scroll like a Facebook than a PDF of a sheet of paper. Okay. And interactive in there, you'll see snippets of video where we went and did a farm visit. So for featuring someone's produce, we have a little inf informational video about that particular farm. Okay. So. Well, I'm sure you know there are other stores, and they're going to have their social media channels, but they don't have what's on Bob's plate. <laughs> Tell me about what's on Bob's plate. So, uh, what's on Bob's plate kind of got started because my my wife um, loves to cook, okay. and she's very creative. Um, one of the problems we have with it is that uh, she doesn't use recipes. She just is sort of a natural, oh. you know, natural cook, and, and goes off a of feel. And she's always experimenting with different flavors. And one of the uh, fortunate things about being in our industry is that you get a lot of samples. So oh. people are always bringing in, you know, new spices and, and things of that nature. And sure. what's on Bob's plate was really a way for us to kind of open people's eyes to different, you know, culinary experiences or different, you know, cultural foods that are out there. Mm -hmm. And also do it with with a wine pairing because I happen to be a a big wine aficionado. So nice. okay. um, when the issue came up, it was just sort of a natural. A natural thing that we were already pairing, you know, food with wine because okay. I, I love to talk about it. And, you know, we just kind of do it ad hoc. Ad hoc. It's my um, ability to kind of have, you know, freedom of expression. It's not really a, an advertisement. <laughs> yeah. And um, if well, we next time we to, do this, we're going to do it at your house. Yeah. Just before one of those entrees come out. Absolutely. Like, What's on Bob's plate? Sounds pretty good. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Uh, a little bit technology wise, too. We were talking before we got on here about this new idea of a sort of a robotic uh, cart for the stores. Do you want to talk about that for a second and tell us, or? Sure. So, um, so we're really big on adopting technology, you know, whether that's um, online, through social media. And we had the opportunity to become the first retailer in Connecticut to uh, adopt the uh, Caper Smart Cart, okay. which is. Um, a cart that was acquired by Instacart, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, interactive shopping cart. So you can use it like a regular old shopping cart if you want and put stuff in and go through the checkout. But if you log into the cart, it gives you the ability to scan as you go. Mm -hmm. It has a built-in uh, weights and measures scale. So if you want to weigh your produce, it'll, it'll item recognize the produce and take the weight for you. And then you can also clip um, digital coupons or see, you know, informational, you know, videos and recipes on the cart as you shop. So it allows you to uh, interact, you know, while you're shopping, and you know, through some of the notifications, if if a manufacturer has a coupon for something, when you put the item in, it'll notify you of that. You can oh clip it, and it'll give you a running tally of everything that you bought which um, for folks that are a little more budget conscious is yeah. a really great feature. So no excuse for missing the, the discounts now or the savings no, because no. it's all there for you. So it does everything it sounds like, but takes it home and cooks it for you and eats it. So pretty it's, much. Uh, that's pretty darn good. <laughs> and you're the first one in the state, you're saying, that's having that available. That's right. Wow, that's all right. So we're all going to be looking forward to coming over and trying that then. Yeah, we, we should have a, a demo version of the cart in our store um, for the grand reopening that's coming up in May. Okay, we'll talk about that in a few minutes too. So what are long-term concerns? Do you have any concerns for the long-term food industry and the, the part that you guys play in it? What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of our concerns are just around, you know, the supply, supply chain and mm -hmm. how that um, got really stressed, especially during the pandemic, yeah. and how um, oftentimes, you know, there's, there's large buying groups that can sometimes wield influence. Mm -hmm. And as an independent, you know, we really just want to make sure that um, folks have equal access to, to products at all times. Okay. You know. So you're not concerned about the long-term sustainability of our farm uh, and our ability to produce product? Uh, nothing like that is on your radar right now? Or? Yeah, I think that that's, you know, the secondary concern, um, especially, you know, as we look at, you know, the larger farms out in the Midwest and, you know, the depletion of our soil and mm -hmm. the health of it and how we, you know, have to add more fertilizers and things of that nature. 
um, you know, that's also part of that fragile supply chain is, is how do we continually, you know, produce enough food to satisfy everybody. And, and the ingredient lists seem to get longer and longer on, right. on products these days. True. Yeah. So. Well, I respect and appreciate the fact that you're trying to stay local. You're trying to, you know, remain family oriented and get the best product in front of your consumers. That's all very noteworthy and I appreciate that as a local consumer. So thank you for, for doing that. And then this, this whole other area of kind of staying committed to the local community. Uh, obviously, you guys have just made a, a wall-to-wall, floor-to-ceiling renovation of your Granby location. Tell me about that experience. Would you do it again? What, what was that all about? Oh, that, I, I love doing that. Um, you know, it's, it's a big endeavor. It takes a lot of planning. Uh, we had planned that renovation for almost two years now, okay. and uh, the, the stars finally aligned to make it happen. But it, it, it is, you know, our way of, of showing the commitment to the community. And, you know, from time to time, you, you have to redo your store to make sure that you're in the right categories that consumers are looking for. Mm-hmm. So, you know, whether it's adding more fresh, which is what we're doing in, in the Granby store, um, introducing more technology with, you know, the carts and things like that. Or you know, just simply um, you know, refreshing your store shelves so you have the right mix of products in the right categories. Tell me a little bit more about some of these renovations, not renovations, but introduction of new kind of technology. I understand your food service for the lunchtime crowd and all that's gonna be a little different. What's happening with all of that as well? Yeah, so we, we always had a, a salad bar and a soup bar. Um, we've expanded the, the soup bar. We've expanded the hot foods bar. We're adding a uh, custom sandwich station. So we were always offering pre-made sandwiches um, you know, they're made fresh on our rolls that are baked in store. Um, if you get the roast beef sandwich, it'll feature our store baked roast beef, oh which my. we do in store. This isn't fair. I'm you very know, hungry right it's, now. <laughs> it's one of our signature items. I mean, you've never had a better roast beef. I mean, it's, it's cut in our butcher shop, it's cooked in our ovens, and then, you know, there's no preservatives. I think there's probably salt, pepper, and garlic on it. Okay. Um, so, you know, now instead of just getting a, a Pre-packaged sandwich, you'll be able to custom order something, and we even have some some options uh, in development for hot sandwiches. Wonderful. And then, in addition to that, um, because we really want to bring you know the fresh as close as we can to people, um, we're introducing a fresh pop popcorn kiosk. Oh, so yeah. we'll be making you know butter popcorn, caramel, kettle, cheddar. <laughs> I imagine um, that goes the aroma that goes through the store. You'll have a oh, lot of it's, it's fantastic, buys, right? Yeah. yeah, we did one in our Aguam store that we renovated last year, and it's been a really big hit. Okay, you know, and then we'll also be featuring a um, fresh squeezed orange juice machine, wow. um, and then in our bakery department, uh, we've partnered with Munson's Chocolate, which is out of Bolton, mm-hmm. which we have in a lot of our stores to do a um, jewelry style you know, chocolatier case featuring truffles and fudge and all kinds of things like that. So this sounds like a date. It sounds like an experience. It's not just your regular shopping trip anymore. It's a little bit of everything, right? No. And, and really it's, it's, you know, those categories that really speak to fresh okay. and, you know, allow people to have a little fun and, you know, sort of differentiate us from, from just a regular old supermarket. So that's sort of your retail side. Now, I don't know, maybe you already do this. I'm not just aware of it. Your catering side or your commercial side going out to the corporate world. What's that all about for you? Sure. So we've been doing catering as long as I can remember. Um, and it does kind of fly under the radar a little bit. Yeah. But we have a, a great catering site that was actually built in-house by one of our team members. Okay. Um, Carol, she's a phenomenal lady. And uh, we launched it to be able to do orders for, you know, corporate customers and also for, you know, private events. events. Yeah, yeah, right. So we have a, a wide variety of platters from, you know, vegetable and fruit and cold cuts to, mm-hmm. you know, hot items, um, whether it's, you know, baked chicken or, you know, our hand rolled store made meatballs. And you can get all of that, you know, in store or delivered. Okay. So coming up on May 4th, which is a Saturday, not too far away, you will be ready. The store will be open for we the grand reopening. We will be reopening. ready. Okay. We're going to hold you to that because a <laughs> swarm of people are going to be there now. What else is going to happen on May 4th? Tell me about it. So we're going to have a, we're going to have a ribbon cutting event. Thank you, um, Chamber of Commerce. Yep. Right? Thanks okay. to the Chamber of Commerce. And we're going to be featuring um, all kinds of sampling throughout the store from our local partners to our signature items. So a lot of the things that we talked about, like our store-made roast beef or our meatballs, we really want people to taste, you know, the Geisler's difference, mm-hmm. which are all of those items that are made, you know, in our commissary and in our stores. Perfect. We've talked about a lot. I think we covered, you know, a fair amount of ground, but I'm sure there's some more that I didn't ask you about you'd like to tell us. What, what else should we hear about from you this, this day? 
Um, I think it's just that, you know, we've been here for 100 years and, and we're not going anywhere. We're really entrenched in the communities that we're in and we're, we're looking to grow um, where the opportunities come available. So, you know, you never know. You could be seeing a, a Geisler's in your backyard sometime oh, soon. Oh, my goodness. Okay. We won't hold you to that, but <laughs> we would welcome it if it happened. So thank you for spending some time and educating me, educating our listening audience. And uh, if there's things that we can do as a Chamber of Commerce, you know, we're reaching out to try to help as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you so much. Thank you for your commitment. And uh, we'll keep good things going. Okay. Thanks. All right, Bob. Thank you. So on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, thank Bob and thank Geisler's for their commitment to our community. We're excited about this May 4th, Saturday open house and the part we're gonna play with a ribbon cutting and doing a few things with them to, to again, introduce some of their samples and, and get the good word out to the community. So come by and join us on May 4th and uh, stop by in the meantime, because the store is still open and doing fine. So thank you all, goodbye. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.